Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and we bless your name. We glorify you because according to the words of Jesus, blessed are our eyes for what we see. Blessed are our ears for what we hear. Because many great men and kings and priests would have desired to hear the deep interpretation and application of the word of God you are giving us, they have not been able to hear. Many theologians and seminary people would have desired to know, to understand, and to be able to explain the depths of what were given unto us. But unfortunately, they have not been able, many of them, to see the practical application and revelation of your word like you are giving unto us. Lord, we give you the glory and we praise your name. We thank you, O Lord, because you have counted us worthy to see all these things from your word. We pray that you accept our praises in Jesus' name. O Lord, we look up to you. We know that it is your, your love alone that has counted us worthy to be partakers of the depth, of the riches, of the mystery of the gospel and of the revelation of your word. Father, we pray that all these revelations you are giving us will not handle with a loose hand, but will take seriously, will embrace them, will believe them, will act appropriately upon them in Jesus' name. Lord, you have been taking us through a series of studies. The series of studies that should make us know how majestic, how highly exalted, how glorious and how gloriously to be feared you are. Father, we pray as we see you exalted, as we see your power magnified, as we see your love and your mercy demonstrated in all these things that we are reading and studying, we pray, oh Lord, it will get us closer and nearer unto you in Jesus' name. We come before you again today, and we know that without you, we can get nothing out of the world. There are many people that come only with their intellect, only with their mind and with their understanding to the word of God, and they do not get much. But Lord, we come humbly before you, depending upon the Spirit of God to make us see, to make us know the truth that is hidden in your word. Reveal yourself unto us in Jesus' name. Lord, we know you will do it, and we pray that all that we learn today, all that we see today, will benefit our lives, will make us channels of blessings to other people, will make us, O oh Lord, to stand firm in the unchanging word of the living God. We pray that you bless us today and make us channels of blessings to our neighbors and to other people around us. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. We praise the name of the Lord who has brought us together once again today to look at the Word of God. We have been studying the series of studies from Exodus. And the Lord has really been revealing to us great, great things in our study of Exodus. At present, we are looking at the plagues of the wrath of God poured out upon the land of Egypt. And you know that God never does anything without a purpose. There are reasons why God has done all these things upon the land of Egypt. In fact, a Pharaoh had yielded, a Pharaoh had obeyed, a Pharaoh had given the Lord the place that the Lord married. All these plagues will not have come upon the land of Egypt. And of course, you know that in the case of Pharaoh, he would readily have granted temporary partial release to Israel to go and worship God maybe in the land, or even not to go very far away. But what he did not want to do is this. He did not want to give full allegiance to Israel's God. Neither did he want to render total obedience unto the Lord. There have been times in our past studies when he said, All right, you can go. You may worship the Lord in the land. Moses said, That wasn't the commandment of God. Another time he said in chapter 8, All right, you can go, but you must not go very far. You see, this is the way of sinners. Very often, sinners who feel the convicting hand of God, they want to give up a few of their sins to appease God and to silence the voice of conscience. But God is not reaching for a temporary removal of some sins. What does he demand? He demands a complete surrender to his will. And it demands a total forsaking of every sin. Sin in every form, every shape or shade. When God speaks to us by his word, there's no use of parleying or attempting to compromise the issue with him. 
if we would receive forgiveness or receive salvation or in fact receive any other kind of blessing from God, we must be willing to go to the heart of the issue and we must be willing to make a full surrender unto the Lord. In the case of Pharaoh, he wasn't willing for that. And his continued rebellion only brought severe plagues upon him and upon his people in Egypt. Today, in particular, we're looking at Exodus chapter 9. But before we look at Exodus chapter 9 today, I want to bring to your notice the arrangement and the order of the plagues that came upon Egypt. This is very significant. If you're a student of the Bible, you should not allow these things to escape you. Because after all, God has preserved such a thing for us so that it will be able to anoint our eyes with spiritual eyes serve. So that we'll be able to see very clearly what he has preserved for his own in the world. Let's look at this. It shows us very clearly that our God is a God of order. The plagues are ten in number. Divided first into nine and one. That is the first nine and then the last one standing clearly apart from all the rest, from all the others. Let's look at the nine. The nine are arranged in groups of threes. In the first of each three, warning is given to Pharaoh in the morning. Now, if you check up, you'll find that the references are written for you on the outline. Not only that, in the first and second of each group of three, the plague is announced beforehand. But then in the third of each group, no announcement is made at all. The plague came suddenly now you can see you can see the order there in the first of each group warning given in the morning in the first two of each group that it was announced beforehand yet in the third of each group no warning at all suddenly the judgment and the wrath and the plague came upon the land of egypt not only that if you look at the groups of three the last of the first group, that's the third. The magicians of Pharaoh acknowledge the finger of God. The last of the second group, that is at the six. They could not stand before Moses. And then the last of the third group, that is the ninth. Pharaoh said that Moses will not see his face anymore. And that he will not even want to see the face of Moses anymore. Once again, look at the first three. Aaron used the rod. Look at the second group of three. The rod is not mentioned at all. Look at the third group of three. You'll find that Moses used the rod, only that in the last part, only his hand is mentioned as being lifted up. All these that are pointed at now, you know what it shows? It shows that God is a God of order. It means that there is a greater and deeper order in all the ways of God. All the ways of God. Let me remind you of just a few. In the case of the creation of the earth, can you see a beautiful, wonderful order? And you see also, in all these plagues are pointed out to you now, can you see a wonderful, beautiful order that even though it was judgment, even though it was the wrath of God being manifested, even though it was discipline coming upon rebellious Pharaoh and also the Egyptians, it was such an orderly thing that God did. As you look at the system of sacrifices of the children of Israel later, as God gave unto them, you will see orderliness in everything that God gave unto them. As you look also at the function of the priests and the function of the Levites and the functions that all those people were to carry out for the worship of God, you will see orderliness. I want you to also realize, I'll see the building of the tabernacle itself. You will see the orderliness in the building of that tabernacle. Also, as you see the settlement of the children of Israel around that tabernacle. Again, this is what you will discover. You will discover orderliness as you see them getting into the land of Canaan. And the way they conquered Canaan, city by city. And a place and then another place. Again, you will see orderliness in everything. It teaches us something that is very, very significant. That, to start with, let's talk about this. Even in discipline, when people are rebuked for doing something wrong, if we're going to follow God, if we're going to do it as God would do it, if we're going to do it for the glory and for the honor of God alone, there will be orderliness. We will not discipline people haphazardly. 
not only that in the service of the lord in the worship of the lord as you look at all these marks in the bible and something you will notice you will do everything the worship of god in the service of god in an orderly manner in first corinthians chapter 14 first corinthians chapter 14 verse 33 for god is not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints then in verse 40 here is the commandment we're given let all things be done decently and in order and i appeal to you as we are following the god of decency the god of holiness the god of order may we do everything we do in the church may we do everything we do in our personal lives may we do everything decently and in order you see there are some people that naturally they don't know how to be orderly in their lives they do things haphazardly and you see here is an encouragement for us that as we come to god it changes our lives it changes our nature it changes our conduct we are to follow god to the point that we are even willing to do things odd in an orderly manner think about your marriage think about what we do in the church think about the services think about the worship think about our singing think about every aspect of the church life it ought to be decently done it ought to be done in an orderly fashion well that is a general look on all these plagues together we're going to look at three particular uh, plagues today in the chapter that we're going to study the chapter we're going to study today brings three peculiar lessons for us therefore you'll see on your outline three points number one plagues of moraine boils and hail number two the special protection and solemn warning point three pharaoh's insincere repentance pharaoh's insincere repentance let's go to point one i'm reading to you from exodus chapter nine we're looking at it from verse one then the lord said unto pharaoh go in unto pharaoh and tell him Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, and wilt hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle, which is in the field, and upon the horses, upon the asses, upon the camels, upon the oxen, and upon the sheep, and there shall be a very grievous moraine. And the Lord shall serve between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt, and there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one and pharaoh sent and behold there was not one of the cattle of the israelites dead and the heart of pharaoh was hardened and he did not let the people go here we see the judgment that came upon the land of egypt the plague of moraine that is a plague of a serious grievous disease came upon the cattle of all kinds of all sorts now we learn a lesson here that the world suffers because of the sin of man think about it don't you know it was when adam and eve sinned that cause came not only upon adam not only upon eve but upon the whole creation the ground was caused the nature of the animals changed everything changed everything came under a cause because of the sin of adam and eve Perhaps you don't understand why. The reason is this. You see, God had created the world to serve man. God had created the animals and the birds and the fish and the water and the land and the sky, everything to come in the service of man. That is why he created all those things and made the world an habitable place and then he created the man. When man sinned, then man had to lose the help, the comfort, the satisfaction of all the things other things that were created the same thing you will see here it was a sin the disobedience and the rebellion of pharaoh and egypt that brought all these plagues upon the animals 
it is telling you something. Whenever an individual sins, it is not a private matter. Your sin will affect other people. Your sin will affect part of the creation of God. And so God warned from verse 1 and verse 2. He said, let my people go that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go, thou wilt and will still hold unto them. It says, then I'll bring this grievous disease, moraine, upon the cattle. The plague of moraine upon the cattle and the livestock came because Pharaoh refused God's commandment, God's condition, God's terms. This judgment was directed against the possessions of the Egyptians. A grievous disease smote their herds so that all the cattle of Egypt died. What a serious sin. What a serious sin. You see, when man sins, the death penalty does not only come upon man, it also comes upon the creation of God that had been given to be an aid, to be an help, to be a kind of satisfaction unto man. This afforded a striking demonstration of the absolute rulership of God. It tells us that every creature in his creation is under his complete control. When the fury of the plague had passed throughout all the land of Egypt, Pharaoh sent to see if Israel's cattle were affected, afflicted or not. What did he discover? He discovered that the cattle of Israel had not been affected at all. In fact, the Bible says not one of Israel's cattle died. Not one of them was stricken. It should have convinced him and convicted him that the God of Israel was fighting against Egypt. But what was the effect upon him? No effect at all. Look at verse 7. The latter part of verse 7. And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened, and he did not let the people go. How I pray that we will not have the kind of heart of Pharaoh. Seeing judgment upon judgment, discipline upon discipline, rebuke upon rebuke, correction upon correction, and yet remaining adamant, unyielding, unbending, disobedient, rebellious, unrepentant, impenitent. I pray that none of us will be like that. So then, because he refused to repent, he refused to, uh, to bend, what happened? Another plague had to come. Look at it from verse 8 all through to verse 12. And the Lord said unto Moses, and unto Aaron, take to you handfuls of ashes of the furnace, and let Moses sprinkle it toward the heaven in the sight of Pharaoh, and it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, and shall be a boil breaking forth with blaze upon man and upon beast throughout all the land of Egypt. And they took ashes of the furnace. And stood before Pharaoh, and Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven, and became a boil breaking forth with blains upon man and upon beast. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. In verse 12, we are told the Lord had in the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. I want you to pay attention because there's something very, very significant here. Something very, very significant. The plague of boils upon man and beast was another fatal blow upon Egypt's idolatry. Now, here is why I want you to pay attention. Secular history has recorded and preserved something for us. Secular history tells us this. It was a custom among the Egyptians to offer human sacrifices to their gods, along with great burnings of various kinds to appease the wrath of certain deities. This is why you will see as you read the rest of the Old Testament, God warning the children of Israel they must not allow their children to pass through the fire. They saw a lot of that in Egypt. They must not make burnings, human sacrifices. They saw a lot of that in Egypt. You see what God was doing here? It's, uh, it's kind of twofold. On the, on the one side, he wanted to convince the Egyptians that all their idolatry was nothing. 
he wanted to convince the Egyptians that all their human sacrifices were not acceptable unto him. In fact, it was abomination unto the Lord. On the other hand, he wanted to show the children of Israel that all they had seen. Please remember that these children of Israel had been in the land of Egypt for hundreds of years. Hundreds of years, generation after generation after generation after generation of the children of Israel had been born in the land of Egypt. And they had seen all these idolatrous things being practiced over the years. And God wanted to show them that all those idolatrous practices will not bring any blessing. It will bring a curse. It will bring punishment. It will bring growth. It will bring evil upon them. Now see, this is what history has said. That after a sacrifice was over, the Egyptians will take handfuls of the ashes of the bodies they are made in the sacrifices. They will throw them into the air to float down over those in attendance. Why were they doing that? They thought they were doing that to arrest evil. They thought they had made human sacrifices to their deities, to their gods, to their idols. And they have taken the bodies of the various kinds, they have taken the ashes, they have thrown it into heaven so that the deities or the gods or the idols will be, will be at peace and will have mercy upon them. What God did is to turn it around. What God did is to tell Moses to take ashes out of the furnace and then to bring their custom to naught, to bring their idol worship into disrepute and to show the children of Israel that if they practice the idolatry of the children of Egypt, it will bring a curse upon them. It will bring judgment upon them. It will bring plagues upon them. And so Moses sprinkled it towards heaven. When the ashes descended upon those people, it brought a severe plague that broke out upon man, upon beasts. Even the magicians were afflicted and they could no more stand before Moses because of the boils. Let's learn our lesson. Let's learn our lesson. The church is to be different from the world. All the practices of the world that they are doing, thinking that they practice those things to bring a blessing upon them. To avert the judgment of their deities, of their gods. All that people in the villages will do to be able to avoid evil. The Lord is telling us that if we do them, it will not make us avoid evil. In fact, it is going to bring a terrible plague, a terrible judgment upon us if we do them. So this is the reason some of these plagues came upon the land of Egypt. So that after Israel had departed from Egypt, they would have learned a never to be forgotten lesson. A never to be forgotten lesson. I hope you learn these lessons too. Never to be forgotten in your mind that if you do those same sacrifices of the Egyptians, you do those same idolatrous sacrifices of the people of the world, instead of averting the judgment of God protecting you, is going to bring a severe plague. So, this came upon the people of Egypt. But we're told instead of it softening the heart of Pharaoh, it hardened the heart of Pharaoh even more and more. The wrath of God was poured out in immeasurable uh, way upon them. Let's look at another plague that even came upon them now as Pharaoh refused to yield when the boils came upon them that even the magicians could not stand. We're going to look at it from verse 18. Verse 18. Let's look at it from Exodus chapter 9 verse 18. Behold tomorrow... About this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as has not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof, even until now. Here God gave warning unto Pharaoh and to the servants of Pharaoh and to the land of Egypt. Here is a wonderful God. Even though this man Pharaoh and, and the servants and the Egyptians had been hardening themselves, yet see the mercy of God. I'll talk more about that when we get to point two. So all the other verses from verse 13 all through to verse 17. In fact, all through to verse 21. We'll talk about that in point two. Now skip all that and reserve it for point two and go to verse 22. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch forth thine hand toward heaven, that there may be hail in all the land of Egypt, upon man and upon beast, and upon every herb of the field throughout the land of Egypt. And Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. And the Lord sent thunder and hail and the fire ran along 
upon the ground and the lord rained hail upon the land of egypt so there was hail and fire mingled with the hail very grievous such as there was none like it in all the land of egypt since it became a nation and the hail smote throughout all the land of egypt all that was in the field both man and beast and the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree of the field now here was another terrible and serious thing that came upon the land of egypt the egyptians thought that some of their gods had control over the operations of the forces of nature this plague of thunder and hail and fire was sent to show them that the idols the gods or the deities of egypt had no power whatsoever and that all these things are actually controlled by the god of heaven whose existence pharaoh and many of the egyptians had denied the severity of this plague is marked by several particulars one it was a very grievous hail two it was such as has not been in egypt since the foundation thereof even until now can you imagine the judgment of god the wrath of god can you imagine the plague coming upon them and the comment about that plague is that since that place became a nation it had never happened like that before never happened like that before you know why it says that now every nation understands what a thunder is i mean there are times you have seen a storm there are times you have seen you know the lightning and the thunder but then, just like every nation will see that, but this one, it had never been like that. In fact, you know what some historians say? Historians say that the hills that were falling, they were like the weight of half a bag of cement. Think about it. Just falling from the sky, falling from heaven. And the fire will run along, not just the lightning in the sky, in the usual thunder, but it will, it will just run on the, on the ground. It was terrifying. It was terrible. The terrors that struck them as a result of this plague, the comment is that it had never been like that since Egypt became a nation. The hail came with fierce intensity so that the fire ran along upon the ground. The effects were equally striking. In fact, it says, the hail smote throughout all the land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, and the hail smote every herb of the field and break every tree in the field. The judgment was, exp was expressive of the wrath of a holy God against an ungodly people. And so you see that all these things came upon them. In fact, this one shook Pharaoh. Oh yes, it shook Pharaoh. I'll talk about that when we get to point three. Let's back up now and go to point two. We're back up in the sense that we go back to the beginning of the chapter. We're going to see two points here within point two. The solemn, the solemn warning that God gave to the Egyptians and then the special protection that he gave to the children of Israel. Let's see them one by one. Number one, let us talk about the special protection for the children of Israel. Go back to chapter 9, verse 4. Exodus chapter 9, verse 4. And the Lord shall sever between the cattle of Israel and the cattle of Egypt. And there shall nothing die of all that is the children of Israel. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow the Lord shall do this thing in the land. And the Lord did that thing on the morrow. And all the cattle of Egypt died. Notice this. But of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. Verse 7. And Pharaoh sent, and behold, there was not one of the cattle of the Israelites dead. Here is the protection of God upon his own. Well, are you surprised? Israel had covenant with God in Abraham. As Abraham made a covenant with God, or rather God made covenant with Abraham, the blessings spilled upon the children of Israel. In fact, this is the very reason why God sent Moses unto the land of Egypt. He said, I remember my covenant with Abraham, and I've seen the affliction of the people of Israel. Arise therefore come and go into Egypt so that the people will be delivered. You see that God had mercy upon the children of Israel. 
protecting them. Look at verse 26. As all the plague of the fire and the hail and the thunder struck in Egypt, look at what happened in verse 26. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, was there no hail. Oh yes, the Lord even knew where those people were living. He knew how to protect them. In fact, it was not only at that time, in other areas, at other times, from other plagues, God had protected the children of Israel. Look at Exodus chapter 8, verse 22. Exodus chapter 8, verse 22. And I will serve in that day the land of Goshen in, in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth. Verse 23, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. And go to chapter 10, verses 22 and 23. How God specially protected the children of Israel. Exodus 10, 22 and 23. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven. And there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt. Three days, verse 23. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. God protected his own, and he's still protecting his own. In fact, do you know this? After the children of Israel left the land of Egypt, God promised them he's still going to keep them separate. He's still going to keep them as a favored, peculiar people. Is still going to be specially protecting them in Exodus chapter 15, verse 26. Exodus chapter 15, and in verse 26, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians. For I am the Lord that healeth thee. I am the Lord that healeth thee. And now you can see what the Lord was saying. He said, I protected you specially when you were in Egypt. Now you have come out of Egypt. My determination is that I still want to specially protect you. And if the children of Israel had continued in the way of God, under the commandments of God, under the full total control of the word of God, they would have been separated from all the nations and all the things that happened. And that is happening in the world will not have happened unto them. In fact, you know, the diseases of Egypt, the diseases of the world will not have been upon them. Unfortunately, unfortunately, in their generations, they did not obey the word of the Lord because they did not fulfill the condition. The special protection did not continue upon them. For us who are children of God today, here is the wonderful thing that we are the apple of the eye of the Lord. There's also special protection for every one of us because you see even the new covenant is greater, is richer, is deeper and has more for us today than the old covenant had for the children of Israel. Look at Psalm 91 and you will see the special protection of God upon his own people. Psalm 91. You might have read this before. I don't want you to be so familiar with the word of God that it doesn't bring the benefits and the blessing it ought to bring unto you anymore. Look at it. Psalm 91 from verse 4. He shall cover thee with his feathers like he covered the children of Israel in Egypt from those plagues. And under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth that shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night. Nor for the arrow that flies by day. All those things that have happened to the people, to the Egyptians, it never came upon, they never came upon the Israelites. They were not afraid. The same thing today, they should not be upon us. In verse 6, Nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Verse 7, A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come near thee, only with thine eyes shall thou see, and shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come near thy dwelling. Well, we have seen very clearly. 
that Israel dwelt in safety and security while those plagues struck Egypt with their terrors. God hid them in the chambers of his love and mercy. While the storm raged so terribly all around them, Israel dwelt peacefully in the land of Goshen. The same thing with us today. God's people will continue to enjoy the peace and the safety and the security in this world in time and also will continue to enjoy that in eternity. Let's even see now the love of God, the mercy of God, even towards the Egyptians. You can't imagine this. That even though the Egyptians had been rebellious, even though Pharaoh had hardened his heart, before God brought these plagues upon Pharaoh and upon his land, he gave solemn warning. Well, this is the nature of God. This is the nature of God. In fact, this is what you discover in the whole Bible. God was talking to Abraham. He said, the cup of iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. He says, they are sinning, but I cannot cast them out yet. Because the cup of iniquity is not full. This is what God did even to the city of Nineveh. He sent Jonah. He said, go and warn them in 40 days. The cup of iniquity will be full. Nineveh will be overthrown. And those people repented. And then they escaped the wrath, the judgment of God. He brought warning to this, uh, to this person, to Pharaoh. Look at it from Exodus chapter 9. Reading from verse 1. Then the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him. Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him. Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. For if thou refuse to let them go and will hold them still, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thy cattle which is in the field. You see, God, God warned the man. Look at verse 5. And the Lord appointed a set time, saying, Tomorrow, tomorrow, the Lord shall do the same in the land. Isn't this a merciful God? He could have stricken, he could have, he could have brought the judgment so suddenly, so vehemently and severely upon him. But no, warning came, solemn warning. Not only that, when the plague of hail and the, the thunderstorms and all the fire will come, God knew that to have terrible uh, consequence upon the land of Egypt. See how he warned them. So lengthy. Look at it from verse 13. And the Lord said unto Moses, Rise up early in the morning, and stand before Pharaoh, and, and say unto him, Thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let the, my people go that they may serve me. For I will at this time send all my plagues upon thine heart, and upon thy servants, and upon thy people, that thou mayest know that there is none like me in all the earth. For now I will stretch out my hand, that I may smite thee, and thy people will pestilence, and I shall be cut off from the earth. He was warning Pharaoh, he said, you see, this is going to end up in your destruction. You are going to be cut off, eventually. If you do not yield, if you do not surrender. In fact, he said in verse 16, In the very deed, for this cause, have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. He said, Pharaoh, I'm not a weak God. You wonder why I have allowed you to rise as a king. Well, I've allowed you to occupy the throne. Oh, yes, I know your heart. I know the end from the beginning. I've allowed you to get to this position so that I will show my power. He could have killed Pharaoh from the very first time he rejected and resisted the will and the word of God. He did not because he left him there to reveal his might and his power and to reveal his justice as well and his long suffering. In verse 17, As yet exalted thou thyself against my people, that thou wilt not let them go, behold, tomorrow. You see the mercy of God. He wanted to bring this terrible plague and this terrible judgment upon them. He now said, I won't bring it today. Let me give you a chance to repent. Let me give you a chance to change your mind. Let me tell you what is going to come. And let me give you a chance to do something about it. Verse 18, behold, tomorrow, about this time, I will cause it to rain a very grievous hail, such as hath not been in Egypt since the foundation thereof even until now. Look at the mercy of God telling him how to even escape the terror of that judgment. Verse 19, Send therefore now, and gather thy cattle, 
and all that thou hast in the field. For upon every man and beast which shall be found in the field and shall not be brought home, the hail shall come down upon them and they shall die. He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and cattle to flee into the houses. Unfortunately, not all of them regarded the word of the Lord. They suffered for it. Verse 21. And he that regarded not the word of the Lord left his servants and his cattle in the field. Warning was given before the plague of thunder, hail, and fire came. And the message stated that those who were struck by the plague would die. Those who feared and believed God could escape the fury of the plague. Even the Egyptians were expected to believe in the judgment to come. You see, we are to believe. The Lord has given us warning. If any reader of the Bible goes to hell, he wouldn't say he had not read about hell in the Bible. If any one of us gets into the judgment of God, we would not say that God has not warned us. In fact, he said, I sent my prophets rising up early in the morning and bringing warning. The unfortunate thing is that the heart of man is set in him to do evil. You see, God brought warnings upon all these people and they were to believe also in the mercy of God and they were to flee from the wrath to come. The text describes for us two classes of people. In verse 20, it describes the people that feared the Lord and feared the word of the Lord and they acted accordingly. They escaped that judgment in particular. And in verse 21, we're told of the second category of people. They set not their heart to the word of God that warned them. They paid dearly for it. Here is a very distinct illustration in history for our use and instruction for admonition. Wholesome fear is an evidence of faith. You see, the people that feared the Lord, they had the evidence that they really had faith in God and they acted accordingly. Let us look at that verse 20 again. In verse 20, it said, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made the servants and cattle uh, to flee into the houses. It was fear and it was faith at the same time. It was a kind of faith that stimulated appropriate action and obedience. You see, careless neglect is the evidence of carnal security, which is a source of spiritual danger. Uh, there are many people today that say they believe in, in eternal security. They neglect all the warnings of the word of God. They live carelessly. They, want to, they should understand that that careless neglect of the warnings of the word of God is evidence not of eternal security because no sinner, no backslider, no sinful person rising and falling is eternally secured. It is an evidence of carnal security which is a source of spiritual danger. God has sent his word to us, full of mingled promises and warnings, full of declarations of mercy and judgment. The question is, are we taking heed? God is warning us. God speaks and warns us of the wrath to come. He warns us by startling events that are taking place all around us. He warns us by the secret stirrings of our conscience. He wants us as we read the Bible and as we are preaching of the word of God from the Bible through a special messenger. Are we taking heed? Do we listen? Do we act in faith and obedience? Or do we count the word of God as an idle tale? If we refuse, we shall be worthy of worse punishment than the Egyptians. Before the hailstorm of judgment comes, let us set our hearts to the word of the Lord. So shall we be saved in the evil day. If we believe that there is wrath to come, we will not rest in inactivity or in action. There is shelter for everyone in Christ and in Christ alone. What are you doing to bring others home into safety in Christ? We must look at that verse 20 again. It says, He that feared the word of the Lord among the servants of Pharaoh made his servants and cattle to flee into the houses. If we fear the warnings of the word of God, then we will make people to come into safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our time is going. Let us look at point three now. Point three tells us of the reaction and the response of Pharaoh. When this terrible plague came, in fact, this one, it made him to tremble. It forced a confession out of him. Look at it from verse 27. And Pharaoh sent 
and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous, and I and my people are wicked. We say concerning Pharaoh, he was without excuse. He knew the judgment of God. He knew very clearly and very unmistakably that he was a wicked man and that his people were wicked. He knew that his rebellion was seen. Look at it in verse 27 again. Here was his own confession. Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said unto them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous. He, he justified the Lord. He said, all these judgments that God is pouring out, God is not to blame. Now, if any theologian will rise up and begin to challenge God, begin to criticize God, begin to say, why should God do this? Why should God bring this judgment upon them? Even Pharaoh, he knew of his own idolatry. He knew of his own wicked mind. He knew of his own rebellion. He knew that all this judgment, that in fact God had been very, very merciful. He knew that in love, he knew that God warned him. And he himself said, the Lord is righteous. If anybody should have complained, Pharaoh should have complained. Why should any theologian come up and be saying that, well, why should God have done that? Why should God have put a plague upon them? Why should God not allow the Egyptians to keep on oppressing the Israelites and worshipping idols? No, Pharaoh said, the Lord was right. The Lord was just. The Lord is righteous. And then he confessed, I and my people are wicked. In verse 28, entreat the Lord for it is enough. That there be no more mighty thunderings and hail, and I will let you go, and ye shall stay no longer. And Moses said unto him, As soon as I am gone out of the city, I will spread abroad my hands unto the Lord, and the thunder shall cease, neither shall there be any more hail, that thou mayest know how that the earth is the Lord's. I must say something here that Moses really believed in the Lord. He believed in the power of prayer. He believed that as soon as he went out and he stretched out his hand towards heaven, towards the Lord, he believed that the Lord will answer. Shouldn't we have such confidence in God when there's judgment, when there's plague, when there's pestilence, when an epidemic is breaking loose all around? Shouldn't we have the confidence that we are the people of God and that if we pray, God will have mercy and God will heal and God will deliver? And then in verse 30, But as for thee and thy servants, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. Well, Moses had what we'll call the word of knowledge. He had deep insight. He knew that all that Pharaoh was doing, he knew that his repentance was not sincere at all. It was not very, very deep. And so he said, we are told in verse 32, but the wheat, sorry, verse 31, and the flax and the barley was meeting, for the barley was in the ear, and the flax was bald, but the wheat and the rye were not meeting, for they were not grown up. And Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread abroad his sons unto the Lord. And the thunders and the hail ceased. Can you see it happened immediately? And the rain was not poured upon the earth. Well, God answered the request of Moses. He answered his prayer. He responded to his request. But look at verse 34. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunders were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. And he, he, and his servants, and the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. You see, here is what we are told. First of all, it will appear that Pharaoh had repented this time, when the plague was at its height. But it was very evident to Moses because he said, Are you sure you are really repenting? It says in verse 30, I know that ye will not yet fear the Lord God. He knew that that repentance was not genuine. He knew that the penitence was not sincere. You see, true repentance has some elements in its constituent parts. It has grief, obviously, but not only grief for as 
penalty for because of the penalty for sin it should have hatred for sin it should have an apprehension of the justice of god as well as the mercy of god true repentance hates the existing sin not only the penalty it suffers for that sin you see sometimes when somebody is under discipline under chastisement because of an evil sin he has done he may look sober i wish sure that is repentance he may look so very gentle and look so flexible and so very humble and he will be pleading before the Lord, oh God, I will not commit that immorality again. I will not do this again. Are we sure that that is real repentance? Or is it because of the shame? Is it because of the penalty? Is it because of the fiery discipline? Is it because of the suffering? We must make sure that if we're repenting, the repentance is not just because of what we're suffering. Pharaoh made some confession of sin simply to get rid of the penalty of sin. Not that he chose to make himself a subject of God's law and an object of God's love. A repentance that springs from fear alone is always transient. You see, though it, it says in verse 27, I have sinned, yet we are told in verse 34, he sinned yet more. His confession was not thorough. It had no depth. It had no careful dealing with his own soul, dealing with his own sin. You see, it happens like that to many people during the times of suffering, of sickness, of punishment, of heavy sorrow upon them. They make promises that they are not going to perform. They make vows and consecrations in times of sorrow, times of sickness, and times of painful discipline. But those things are some forgotten when relief or when healing comes. We learn some lessons here. Open confession of sin may not be a true sign of true repentance. Well, it's all right. Uh, there are people in the Bible that confess sin openly. But what we're saying is that it may even so happen as a case of Pharaoh. He made an open confession. That didn't mean he was having true repentance. It may be the outcome of necessity. It may be the outcome of terror. You see, there are times when some people have committed immorality before they got married. And yet, they will not confess. It may be because now there is no child in the family. Then they will come and make a confession. Is that true repentance? Are they making the confession because they hate sin? They fear evil? Are they, are they making the confession because they do not want to go to hell? Because they want to embrace the mercy of God? Because they want to do right according to the scripture. Or are they just making that confession? Because look at it now for some months, for some years. We have not had a child. Let us go and confess so we can have a child. We must make sure that our confession is not just because of necessity. Not just because of terror. I'm not saying you shouldn't make your confession. You should. But make sure that you really feel the deep sorrow for sin. We cannot always gauge repentance by the utterance of the leaves. Pharaoh's confession was a false confession. Extorted from him by the suffering that he endured and the fear of still heavier judgments coming upon him. His confession was not accompanied with humility, not accompanied with obedience before the Lord. There was no renunciation, rejection of sin. The convictions from which those confessions, uh, confessions sprang were as temporary as the judgments that gave rise to them. Remorse is not repentance. Conviction is not conversion. You see, in verse 27, he said, I have sinned. We see several people that said that same thing in the Bible. Pharaoh said it. Balaam said it when the angel confronted him. Achan said it when Joshua said, My son, give the glory to God and confess what you have said, what you have done. Saul said it before Samuel. He said, I have sinned. But then he gave an excuse. David confessed before Nathan, I have sinned. Shimei confessed before David, I have sinned. In fact, Israel also, in figurative terms, in Micah, he confessed, I have sinned. Judas Iscariot confessed, I have sinned. And the prodigal son returning back home said, I have sinned. But then you know that in the case of Pharaoh, it was not deep, it was not sincere. In the case of Balaam, he still continued in his way of error. He didn't turn back. He didn't turn away from the sin. 
In the case of Akan, it was after they went through a lot of prof a, a lot of processes, finding out from this tribe and from this family and then from this person. Eventually, when he was found out, he was told, why don't you make a confession? In the case of Saul, he just made a confession eventually, but was all the time still giving the excuse that people had spared all this and spared all that to worship and to sacrifice unto your God. Of course, in the case of Judas Iscariot, you know what it was. He knew that he had betrayed the blood of the innocent one, and he came to make a kind of confession that didn't earn him forgiveness or salvation. But we find some people that had genuine confession. In the case of David, immediately Nathan said, look at what you have done. That man knew the, ter the sinfulness of sin. He knew the depth of corruption in his own heart. He knew the height of degrad the depth of degradation and the heart of in the height of evil he had gotten himself into and he made a deep wholehearted confession unto Nathan. He said, Nathan, I have sinned. And you know, immediately God said that repentance is genuine, is deep to the depth of the heart. He said, Tell him his sins are forgiven. Look at the prodigal son. He came back home. In fact, when he was in the far country, he said, I will arise. I will go to my father. I will say unto him, I have sinned before thee. I am not worthy to be called even thy child. But make me one of the hired servants. He came to his father and said, I have sinned. You see, if you know you have sinned, let your confession be as genuine as that of David. As genuine, as wholehearted as that of the prodigal son. That the Lord will be able to see the genuineness and the depth of the sorrow for sin that you have. And will be able to forgive you. What we know that God is a wonderful God of mercy, of love, of forgiveness. If you will repent and you will turn away from sin. And you make your repentance valid and your confession very true. The Lord will forgive you. And it will not bring you to judgment. We've learned a lot of lessons today. And now we're going to pray. I want you to remember the things that you have learned. We have learned that God is a God of order. Don't bring this orderliness into the service, into the church, in the church. Don't bring this orderliness into the marriages, into the worship, into the activities, into anything that we do. Because our God is a God of order. We have also seen the severity of the judgments that came upon the impenitent. And let us make sure that we are not stubborn before God. We are not adamant on our own way. We are not self-willed. Lest the wrath and the judgment of God will come upon us. Let us rejoice in the special protection of the Lord. Let us rejoice in the mercy of God that will give a solemn warning unto any of us before the judgment will even come. And in fact, we have been told to flee from the wrath to come. Let our repentance, let our confession be not that of Pharaoh, but let it be similar to that of David and similar to that of the prodigal son. The Lord is waiting for you. He has mercy for you. And wouldn't you take these same words and go and share with other people? Many people are in ignorance. They do not see. They do not know. All this, the depth of the truth of what we're learning. Wouldn't you take this outline and go and share with other people? Wouldn't you even get the cassettes and share with other people? It can be a real blessing to other people that are denied of the truth of the depth of the word of God. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord today. Talk to the Lord. Let what you say to the Lord in line with the study we have today make a deep impression upon your heart and life. Make a real change in your life that this is will not leave you the same as it found you. That you will say, oh Lord, make a definite change, permanent change in me because of all this that I'm learning. The Lord will do it, will touch your life, will make use of you like he made use of Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt.